four uh, sessions in this uh, in this room, and the first one is uh, Lars and uh, Andreas, and they will be talking about uh, software development there. Also. Enjoy. Thank you, and uh, welcome to this presentation about software bill of materials seen from a software configuration management perspective. My name is Lars Bendix. I'm an academic. I work at Lund University, and I teach a lot of software configuration management theory for my students. Yes, my name is Andreas Jansson. I'm a consultant working for a company called QCM, uh, where I've been working with configuration management, DevOps, uh, CICD, and stuff like that. Uh, and I represent the industrial part of this presentation. And both Andreas and I, we are part of the Scandinavian network of excellence in software configuration management. So we do some work together. The agenda for today? Yes, we have written a white paper about software bill of materials. So we will go through that in the first part of this presentation, a little bit about the motivation, why should we have software bill of materials, a little bit of the history of software boom, as we, as we call it, some use case categories that we found during our work, and some general considerations when you create your software bill of materials. So then the reason why we started on this work was because we talked a little bit together some years ago when uh, software bill of materials became very hyped. And uh, we thought that, uh, well, there's no reason to hype it because it's been around for a long time. And uh, then we saw that uh, cybersecurity is sort of trying to steal away software bill of materials from SCM. So we thought that we might try to steal it back again. So we wanted to take back control. After the white paper, uh, we met some people, we did some presentations, we had some discussions, and the feedback from all these discussions is what is fed back into the second part of the presentation. So there we will dig a little bit deeper into how configuration managers look at software bill of materials, how developers should be the largest user group of software bill of materials, and uh, anyone here doing cybersecurity? You can go to sleep now and you can go back five minutes before we end. There will be a little bit about cybersecurity in the end. Um, but we'll try to steal back software bill of materials from you. Because basically it's nothing about software, bill, uh, software, uh, software uh, cybersecurity. And then there will be a little bit of Q&A in the end. Yes, so software bill of materials should have been an internal requirement since the beginning of the 80s. So we were very surprised when cybersecurity started to talk about software bill of materials because uh, we didn't see cybersecurity as the largest user group. So we saw the developers that should have been and have been using software bill of materials for more than 40 years. And the software bill of material is not only for the application that you develop. We during our investigation for the pre uh, white paper, we saw that uh, software bill of materials could be used for all software in all systems. So you know what you're running in your servers and what not. not. One of the things that we're doing as configuration managers is taking care of change management. And when we're handling changes, sometimes cybersecurity also enters into the picture. And if we have software bill of materials there and we know what we have, then uh, change management becomes a lot easier to handle and we get more information. And developers are the optimal or the primary producers of the data for the software bill of materials. Uh, so we capture the data when it's, it's created. So basically, today we are going to tell you how you can use, as developers, and maybe also cybersecurity in the last five minutes, uh, these software bill of materials and how you can help us as configuration managers to create these. So we are going to give you the full story, and there's a lot more than cybersecurity in this. 
So basically, here we have examples of software bill materials. So as a teacher at university, during the pandemic, we were using Zoom. And uh, I discovered that uh, I hope that they see it as software bill materials. So these are sort of identifications of what is exactly in this version of Zoom. And uh, then they also have connected to this information, some release notes. Hopefully they know what source code, what version of the source code went into it, what libraries, what tools they were using. So they will be able to recreate and debug all this. So there's no funny thing about software bill materials. It's something that's been used for, I would also almost say decades, but uh, centuries, but it, it, it must be decades. All right, here is a little teaser for the security guys. Um, in 2021, President Joe Biden signed the executive order 14028. And that was to strengthen the United States capability of responding quickly and efficiently for yeah, bugs in, in software, soft, uh, such as Heartbleed and solar wind, and that kind of things. So he issued an order to the Department of Defense and NTIA uh, uh, to come up with guidelines and rules for what the software bill of material should be. And they came up with like, the min minimum viable product for a list of ingredients. And um, while they did a really good job with that, uh, to formalize that list of ingredients, we think that there is more to software bill of materials. So that's what we will talk about yeah, from now on. And when the president of the U.S. Uh, does a sec executive order, people, they listen and the administration obey. And he gives them, I think it was 30 or 60 days to come up with software bill of materials. And they did that. Actually, they had been working on this area for a couple of years. But uh, let's go further back in time, back to the 1980s. So in the 1980s, Wayne Babbage wrote a book about software configuration management. And uh, there's a quote in that book that says, many times the fastest approach to finding a, finding a bug is not analysis of the program itself, but analysis of the history of the program, how it was created. The history of the program is called its derivation. Basically, what Wayne Babis is talking about in the early 1980s is software bill of materials. And if we have software bill of materials, we can compare one software bill of material for something that works with a software bill of material for something that doesn't work. Look what the difference is, and maybe that is where we should start looking for the bug. So, what is in the derivation? So the tools we are using for creating something, the things that we used as input for these tools, identification of options and arguments for the tools, and uh, we could go on and extend this list. Basically, it depends on what you want the granularity of differences to be. Do you care about whether it was compiled with one option or the other? If you do, that information should be included in the duration or in the software bill of material. And as his quote is in, in the book, an ounce of derivation is worth a pound of analysis. So instead of looking at two million lines of code, we can have these software bill of materials help us focus in on the real differences between what works and what doesn't work. Okay, so let's go back. Back again, again in the future. So back in the 80s and early 90s when uh, our favorite tool was ClearCase and all that, uh, all those tools in that tool set, um, ClearMake automatically created software bill of materials during build time. Uh, and this was to be able to reuse built code in an efficient and secure way. Uh, to reduce build times and to know what we actually built. Uh, so the, these uh, 
configuration records contained information about what went into the build, the para parameters that built the software, and also the outputs. So it knew if you could reuse it or if you had to rebuild the software. And those configuration records were machine readable, so it could be in a pipeline or whatever. And you can also query the configuration records manually from the command line to get information about how these binaries, the object files, uh, were built. So tracing back software bill of materials, we go back to the early 80s in the software engineering. And uh, that's not an awful lot of work that has been done. And uh, some companies, they don't even know what a soft bill of material is. But uh, doing research and finding material, interviewing configuration managers, older configuration managers, they sort of could tell stories, oh, yeah, back in the good old days when we were doing this. And in some companies, they're still doing it. So we had a lot of material for our white paper, and we came up with a structure of three basic ingredients of a software bill of material. Yeah, so we wanted to expand the software bill of material, uh, so it was not only a list of ingredients, but um, the first uh, yeah, category uh, was build of materials. And the use case for that is to search for a specific uh, object with a unique ID. And that is basically where the Americans, they have been uh, the Department of Defense when they created the Bill of Materials. They sort of try to speak about it in popular terms and say it's a list of ingredients. So basically it's the list of ingredients for making a pizza. And the second use case category is build of process. How was this software built, this binary built? And this information is useful for debugging and rebuilding and, and analysis of what went into the build. And I can see that we have an Italian here. So can you make a good pitch just from a list of ingredients? No. We also need a procedural description of how we should mix these ingredients that are on the list. So we need to know the temperature of the oven, we need to know all the timing and all, all the tools that we are using for producing this pizza. And finally, bill of information. And this is information that you need uh, to, to cover other aspects of what you've built. For example, you need it for license tracking, uh, maybe test-related matters. We'll come back to that in a few slides. Uh, you need to keep track of some information for legal aspects. And for a pizza, what I do, I'm a pizza nerd, and I'm a configuration management nerd and software bill of material nerd. So I have a bill of information for my pizza recipe so it says, where can I buy this type of olive oil? Um, last time I made it this way, what did people like about it? And a lot of other useful information that I have around my pizza cooking. Gradually improving it. All right, so if we start with the first use case category, the bill of material. Um, that's a list of things that went into the build or what came out of the build. And uh, this is used for searching for an object using its unique ID. Uh, and we can also analyze what we've built. For example, uh, are these features included in this build? This new library, is it already in or did we miss it? Um, and what is running in our systems right now? Just to make sure that when we update something, we don't miss anything. So when we add the, the process perspective to the materials, uh, we're talking about being able to reproduce or produce some uh, binaries that we have. Uh, 
usually we would like to recreate those so they become exactly identical to something that we have in the past. Having just the source code, having the version of the source code is not enough. Uh, people that have done escrow uh, development where you deposit the source code so your customer believes that if you go bankrupt they can just pull out the source code and continue to develop. Uh, you will know that there's a lot more into it than, than the source code. Also the tools and all the environment set up and uh, so on. And if we should be able to reproduce or produce software, we also need to capture this. Otherwise, we'll be left just with the list of ingredients and then uh, we have to work our way through that. The way that the, the, the degree to what you want to include in the sort of the process aspects into the software bill of material depends on what it is that you're producing. If you're producing control software for a nuclear power plant or from some medical device, then uh, you would probably like to keep account of all the things also in your development environment that could potentially influence uh, the outcome of a build. And build of uh, information category. <coughs> this uh, is information that you can use for uh, communication to end customers, uh, audits for uh, governments uh, checking you up, and certifications if you have a product uh, that you need to be uh, that need to be certified. For example, uh, currently working in the automotive industry. You need to have certain certifications for the car to, to run on the roads. Uh, also, test-related matters. Uh, in case a system uh, involves human safety, for example, a car or medical equipment, uh, you need to keep track of how you tested and verified your software, what environments you tested it in, what you, test cases and the test results. and. Um, this can be used as a proof if there is a legal dispute. I've heard stories from my industry that you, they, at some point in time they needed to dig out a lot of test results and test information to prove that it was not our product that made the error, it was a driver error. <clears throat> and you can also use it as a sales pitch. Our software has been tested and it matches this level of conformance for some kind of standard and then you can have that in your advertisement. So as you can see in the corner, a software bill of material is composed by bill of material, bill of process and bill of information. And uh, what really intrigued us was when we looked into hardware bill of materials, uh, digging out an old book and discovering that also for hardware bill of materials they talk about the list of ingredients, they, lead, they talk about how the processes are for producing this product, and they talk about additional information that we need to keep on the product. For instance, what is the weight, uh, how, how much does it cost to ship this, and uh, stuff like that. So it's not just software bill of materials that have included the, the process and the information aspects. We got literally hundreds of use cases when we start interviewing people and when we start looking through the literature. And uh, we sort of structured them into these three overarching categories, the material, the process, and the information. And within these, we had some groups of use cases that were quite similar. Afterwards, I, as the academic, was quite happy. Now we had sort of structured this and found a good model. But uh, Andreas wouldn't let it be at that. He said, we need to think about how to implement this. And uh, we came up with a number of considerations that uh, you need to think about when you have to actually implement these software bill of materials. Sort of like level of the detail of the software bill of material, the availability of the software bill of material, how you can automate and uh, both creating and using uh, these software bill of materials. These software bill of materials has a tendency to become huge. So like several hundred uh, kilobytes of data. 
And uh, if you don't have some automated tool that can help you, then uh, it's not very useful. And then uh, you have to consider whether you would like to have data in your software bill of material as static or dynamic information. Uh, there seems to be some heated discussions about that, and people, they don't agree. But as long as you're consistent about it. Uh, my personal opinion is that uh, a software bill of material is a precise description of a binary as built, which means that it's static information. It doesn't change. But we can talk about that after the presentation. Yes. And also, you need to keep the software bill of material up to date. It's one thing if you need to produce some kind of bill of material for an audit uh, every six months, then it can take some time, maybe a couple of weeks, to, to write down everything in a document and all the sur surrounding procedures about that. But if the software bill of materials updates uh, several times per day in a build system, in a pipeline, then it needs to be automated. And as I mentioned before, we came to the conclusion that you need a, a software bill of material for everything, so you know what's running in your systems and how you produce your own uh, applications. Um, then we found this is perhaps a, a, an area for further investigation. When we have a, a system consisting of microservices that can be distributed and completely disconnected. Uh, how do you get a software bill of material out of that? Because different parts can be updated at any point in time. Um, and also, you need to think about your unique identifiers, how you name things, and how you version things. Yep, so from uh, our white paper, the key takeaways, uh, if you are a consumer of software bill of materials, then uh, there are external consumers, and uh, for those, we would like to give you the message that uh, software bill of material is a lot more than a list of ingredients and vulnerability scan. That is one very small use case for this, and uh, for the internal consumers, the producers of software, then the daily work that you have, then we found literally hundreds of use cases and uh, we grouped them into 10 categories that uh, have these uh, three uh, aspects of material process and information. Software bill of material for producers, uh, builders of the binaries, uh, the, the developers. Uh, they are the yeah, main pro pro providers of data that go into the software bill of materials. And in order to do that, you need to automate this procedure so the developers can develop instead of creating documents. And the more and more that then Andreas and I, we talked about these software bill of materials and how they were organized and how they could be organized and what they really were, uh, we sort of dawned us, uh, on us that uh, it looked a little bit like configuration items that have attributes and relations, and uh, that the things that uh, cybersecurity or other people would like to have out of these software bit of materials looks a little bit like asking questions to the co configuration status accounting. So software bill of materials, they are our binary configuration items with all the attributes and relations, the information about them. And the uh, configuration status accounting allows you as a developer, you as a tester, you, there you were, you as a cybersecurity, to ask questions on this configuration management database and get out information that is useful for you. Now, looking forward, uh, we found that there was, we, we thought that we had made an end to it, and finally taking back control of software configuration, uh, software bill of materials. 
Um, but talking to people, we found that uh, there were a lot of nuances and aspects about it. So there were things that we could dive deeper into, and uh, we did that. And uh, these are some of the things that we discovered after the white paper. So who can benefit from these software bill of materials? A lot more than just the Department of Defense and US. So externally, the consumers of software, end users, I don't know why they should worry about software bill of materials. I know that my father, as a user, he doesn't care about software bill of material. He doesn't even know what it is. Me, as a user of Firefox, Thunderbird, other things, Zoom, when I get a software bill of material, I don't scan that for vulnerabilities. I expect the company to do that. So end users, they, unless they're the Department of Defense and they don't trust anyone, then they shouldn't be interested. Buyers of software, one of my brothers has a small shop and uh, he actually pays for the software that he buys and that he uses. Um, he doesn't care about software bill materials either. He expects that paying money for the software, the providers of the software, they will do the vulnerability scan if that is what you want to use the software for. Actually, we can divide the buyers up into two classes. Buyers of applications, like my brothers, basically they wouldn't care about software bill materials. But if you buy libraries to use in your development effort, maybe you would be interested in the software bill of material such that you know what it is that you're building into your product. Yes, and we also have external stakeholders that, uh, or internal, sorry, uh, that use uh, software bill of materials. Uh, developers are one key group that use uh, software bill of materials in, uh, in their daily work. Also, quality assurance uh, can use to, to audit uh, what we built to see if it meets the quality expectations, if everything is in. Cybersecurity, again, they should know what goes into the software so we can, so we can tell our customers that uh, this is, as far as we know, secure software. And also software configuration managers, and we need to, to keep track of this as well. Yep, and turning back to these configuration items and the state of uh, the software world, so this is the modern digital infrastructure, and the little piece that you have down there, that is left pad. And what happens is that at a certain point, the developer, one single person of left pad, became angry and decided to move, remove that from the internet, which caused millions of applications to stop working because they had been using left pad. I've been told that Log4j is slightly better because they have two or three developers. But again, it's sort of, it's a little shaky that if you remove a little brick, then the whole house comes down. What is in an SBOOM or software bill of material? Uh, as we said before, it's a list of ingredients, plus plus. We have more information in the software BOOM that we need to have. It's a machine readable inventory of binaries. Uh, it also keeps track of dependencies and uh, relations. So we know that this library is using this library, is using those two other libraries. Uh, we have metadata about legal requirements, licenses, uh, and so on. Uh, we also have, uh, the, the, or the SBOM can be flat in structure or in a hierarchy, so one software bill of material can include others. So it's a dependency tree. 
Yeah, so how do we use and create value from a software bill of material? So as we saw on a previous slide, Wayne Babbitt's already back in the 1980s realized that uh, if we have a complete description of something that works and yesterday and a complete description of the thing that doesn't work today, if we do a diff on these derivations like he called them software bill of materials like we would call them today, then we can have a first clue of where we should go and look for the box. So bug hunting is a very good way that we can create value of software bill of materials. We can also keep track of dependencies and relations, so we get traceability, so we know where we get things from, also what is using what. Reproducible builds. Um, some, in some contexts these days, uh, reproducible builds are maybe not as important. So we saw this morning that uh, when we have to deploy something in different environments, that uh, if we use only one build and deploy the same build in the different environments, then we don't. Then we have, will have less problems. But if you are not able to do that, or if you have to reproduce something that you created five or ten years ago to create either bug fix or to implement some new functionality, then you need to have reproducible builds. Uh, it's also useful when you're upgrading your system. You know what's running already, and you know what you're upgrading to. Uh, then you know if the upgrade will be uh, an easy one or a tricky one, or if you have to do it in steps and, and so on. And when we are using components that we don't create ourselves, then we have to do a risk analysis. What is the risk that I run by using some functionality that you have produced? What is the risk that of vulnerabilities that I get if I buy a library from you or an open source library? So considering what it is that we're using, we need to do some risk analysis. Sometimes it's more like uh, software uh, cyber cyber security other times it could be just like the small brick we saw there one person producing some something that uh, maybe will not be on the internet tomorrow that is quite risky to use yeah and we can use the software boom to identify problems uh, and notify uh, parts of the organization that we need to maybe recall or we need to upgrade uh, to a newer version of something that's causing problem. It doesn't have to be cybersecurity, it can be other problems as well. Yeah, and that connects very nicely to the business area that you are in, uh, car manufacturing. So this is what car producers, they are doing. They are identifying problems, they're notifying the people, and they're recalling some of the cars. They have a perfect bill of material on their cars, so they only recall the necessary cars. It seems like the software industry, the best we can do is that we can say, well, if you upgrade to the latest version of this, maybe the problem is not there anymore. Maybe we can do better with these uh, software bill of materials. Now, who can create these software bill of materials and, and how should they do it? In our opinion, those who should and can create the software bill of materials are the people that are actually building and producing the binaries, the applications. So when you are creating a binary, then uh, you're also the perfect person for creating a software bill of material for that, because you're doing the job. The time, we, during some of the interviews, we heard about people that saying that, well, when it's about time to create a software bill of material, uh, the manager pulls out a huge Excel spreadsheet and then we start putting in data into this and then uh, we take a couple of months to go through it and verify that that actually corresponds to real life. At the time when you are producing this binary, you have all the data that needs to go into it, so you should also put it into it. And then, in our opinion, we should do a software bill of material for each and every binary that is produced. If we do that, 
then we always have software bill of materials for everything that we have. So software bill of material from a software configuration management point of view. We all already mentioned this, that uh, the software bill of material is the binary yep, results of our, our configuration items, and they are configuration items in themselves, so we need to keep track of them. Uh, we also have different attributes describing the the configuration items, how they were produced, uh, where they come from, and so on. Also relations, if the if a configuration item has relations to other configuration items. And we put this data in the uh, configuration management database so we can extract information from that later on. So we perhaps will not store the software bill material in the CM database, but we can extract the information that we need at a later time. Built on that foundation of the configuration management database, we can provide some added value. The activity, the service of configuration status accounting, at least in modern configuration status accounting, is answering all the questions you never had an answer for before. So it's a service that uh, if we have it, we can ask questions like, do we really need to use 84 different versions of Spring? Do we need to have 15 different XML parsers? Things that uh, might puzzle you if you're a project manager to see that your developers have actually created and developed an environment where this is the case. When we do change control, if uh, we know what it is that we want to feed into the system what changes there are, uh, what bill materials, what risks there are, then uh, we can provide a lot more information to the decision makers of whether we should accept or reject some changes. Configuration audits, when we have a software bill material, again, we have a lot of information that we can feed into the process of doing a configuration audit. Baselines, traceability, and software bill materials, those are hardcore configuration management concepts. Baselines, they are equivalent to what the Department of Defense calls a list of ingredients. Traceability, being able to trace what happens if we change something here, what does that depend on? That information, if we have software bill of materials, these uh, dependencies and these traceabilities are sort of built into them and we can scan them. And then uh, listening in on uh, a line of podcast about software bill of materials, uh, I was very pleased to hear that uh, I'm not the only one who has read the book uh, by Adam Thornhill, uh, Code as a Crime Scene, where basically he sees uh, everything, all the information that is put into to the configuration management database and the configuration stats accounting activity as mining and finding out where is the hotspots. Where are the clues and uh, how can we put these clues together to be a Sherlock Holmes that can identify the killer? So software bill of material from a developer point of view, when uh, we find a new library that we really want to use, what should you be asking yourself before you start to use it? Uh, what information do you need? So. Is this in active development? Is it, does it have an um, end of life that you know of? Will it be supported for a long time? Uh, yeah. Are there many contributors uh, working on this? How is the online support for this library? Does it have other dependencies? Does it use um, fishy libraries that you don't want to use in your software. And also check the licenses for this library. If we use this and link this into our own software, do we have to expose some of our software or, or all of our software? Uh, these are just a few examples of questions that you should ask yourself as a developer. Uh, 
from your different backgrounds, you can probably fill up this list 10 times more. So we leave that up to you. Yep. This is actually a quote from my wife. She claims that I'm a huge repository of useless information. Uh, maybe that's so. Uh, some quotes that I picked up uh, both on the podcast and when we were discussing with people is that uh, 80 to 90 percent of an application's code is external. So that's not something that is developed internally, uh, which means that we are actually using a huge amount of code that maybe we should have a little bit better control over that and know what it is that we're using. Seven, six out of seven vulnerabilities come from these transitive dependencies. So the vulnerabilities, they are in the external things, usually in the external things that we're using. Organizations keep fetching known vulnerable versions. Like 18 months after the vulnerability of Log4j was made public, 30% of the downloads were still for the vulnerable version. Maybe people, they don't like to use the latest version because nobody has checked that, but maybe you shouldn't use these vulnerable versions. And then from uh, these uh, podcasts, I learned a not lot of new abbreviations, CV, VEX, VDR, Guac, Taco, Salsa, um, the first two uh, about the vulnerabilities and the disclaimers saying that uh, we have Log4j as a library in our product, but we are not using the vulnerable parts. Those are those that are interesting. Are there still some people from cybersecurity here? You can wake up now. Yep, so we have uh, a bit of a proposal, as you can see here in the picture. <coughs> we call this shift left uh, security um, that you will see in the next coming slides. So we have a developer here in the middle, middle that used the latest and greatest in his build environment. He always wants the latest version of this uh, library that he picks up from the internet. So there is no control actually what comes in and it can break things and whatnot. Then he produces a binary and the security guy, he doesn't really know what went into this build. What, do we have any known vulnerabilities here or what, whatever made it in into this? And he don't know because he's moving on. He's already downloaded the next version. So our proposal here is to, we still have our very creative developer here, and, but now he's using a specific, specific version of, this, of the library that he wants to use. And it's in store, uh, stored in an internal repository that the company has full control over. He realized that, okay, there's a new version of the library I want to use with an, a bunch of new features. So he talked to the security guy. Hey, can you check this new version that I want to use? The security person checks the internet. Um, does this version of the library contain any uh, known bugs uh, or any other problems? Uh, and he has a list of, of all these trouble reports for, for this library. Uh, he can approve or disapprove the inclusion of this library. So if it's approved, then it's copied to the internal repository and the users can, uh, developers can use that new version instead. Now when we produce a binary to the left, uh, right, then we know that we are using an approved version uh, of this library. So we shifted the security guy to the left to improve the knowledge that we have when we create the binaries. So what, what really bothered us as, about the previous situation was sort of the absence of, of the internal repository, the absence of a configuration management database, because that is the reason for our job. And it also annoyed us that uh, we are responsible for this internal repository 
and these are the crown jewels of the company and uh, we were not so happy that uh, the developers could sort of decide what they wanted to use. So we want to have a little bit of help from people from cybersecurity for the external things so that we know that what we put into the repository that people can use internally in the company is very good stuff. Yeah, and uh, this is one example. This could be used for other, other things as well, to, to check a license before you include a new library in your software, so you don't end up in a, a legal dispute with someone or another company, for example. So use your imagination to shift left. Yeah, we came across some other interesting quotes. So uh, the suggestion that if, if people are afraid of sharing the software bill of materials, maybe we could just share the libraries that we have used for our application. Most probably the vulnerabilities are there after all. So we can answer questions like, are we directly or indirectly using Log4j, which is not something that has been produced in the company, but something that we're using externally. Then someone pointed out that uh, apart from cy people from cybersecurity, Log4j is not the normal case. It happens once every 10 years or whatever. Uh, ordinary bugs, they are the real case, at least for developers. And if we have software bill of materials, also for the internal things, we will be able to ask, uh, answer questions like, where is this internal library reused? So we have found a bug, we have fixed the bug, now we need to update the applications that are actually using this internal library. What are those and what are the versions that are doing that? The key takeaways from this part, Software bill of material is a lot broader than vulnerability scans and there are a lot more use cases, so it's a really value com valuable concept. And the material or the, the, yeah, the raw data for a software bill of material should be collected when it's created, so during the build process uh, or during the test process, so you get the, the most reliable and also automated, automated uh, way of creating this uh, data. And since we insist that every binary should have a uh, bill of material, then uh, we can't avoid talking about automation, 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 automation. Then uh, it becomes, becomes automatic to produce a software bill of material. So put it into your pipeline. And. Uh, if we shift left security, we do the security right and other things as well. And then we actually managed to find a picture of uh, cybersecurity people and the US Department of Defense working on software bill of materials. Those are the people on the right. And we as configuration managers, we already have the solution. We have already thought about this for more than 40 years. Uh, but apparently, people, they want to reinvent the wheel. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs> Any questions so we can win our gifts? Ah. <laughs> Uh, I have two questions, one very serious, one less so. First, then, do you put uh, pineapple on your pizza? Sorry? Um, do you put pineapple on your pizza? That, that's an Italian here, so... <laughs> uh, I'm going to hold you to an answer on that one. Uh, My wife doesn't like pineapple on the pizza. Okay, okay and then the last serious question. Have you, uh, are you aware of Nick's, Nick's package manager? Are you aware of it? Have you looked into it? We have looked a little bit about uh, package managers. They, they are sort of doing a lot of the stuff uh, that is also very uh, similar to software bill materials. Package managers in general or Nick specifically you have looked into? Um, more generally. Yeah. More generally. Okay, so. I'd say recommend looking into Nick. It sounds very, I, like, 
it sounds uh, very familiar to what you're talking about. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you a lot. So we, we've also been talking about to, to, to people using uh, Kubernetes and Docker and containers and uh, they, they, are, they are producing software bill of materials, but they have a lot of issues around how they should represent them and, and how they should uh, combine these different software bill of materials. So it's, from my perspective as the academic, the theory is sort of beautiful and clear. When you get into the implementation details, that is where it completely depends on what is your context and what is the, the, the real use for the, the software bill of materials. All right, yep. thank you very much. I have a present for you. 